Hey, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Laura Meltzer. I'm the alumni coordinator from the School of Labor and Urban Studies, and you are at an alumni talk series event. We are opening this event tonight to everyone from our community uh, because we're especially uh, proud of one of our newest programs here at the school. Um, we host alumni talk series at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, and tonight we uh, will be joined by Professor Rebecca Lurie, uh, who will be speaking about the Community and Worker Ownership Project. The Alumni Association at the School of Labor and Urban Studies is hosted and run by alumni themselves, and we are looking forward to many more events to come and also to this evening. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to remind everyone that there is live transcription available for this event, and we will be recording this meeting and looking forward to it. Great. Thank you, Laura, everybody. Um, I'm gonna do a share screen. My name is Rebecca Lurie, as you might see on my, uh, on my box. Let me get this tech going just right. Screen share happening? Yes, thank you. So I know some more people will be entering the room, but it's very exciting to see all of you here. So again, Rebecca Lurie. And um, how lucky am I to be able to do work that I love at the School of Labor and Urban Studies and in the city that I love so much. Um, I'm gonna run through the slide deck with a few things that should take us probably, I figure about 30 minutes for me to go through the deck to talk to you about what I've been through and what I wanna share and then open it up for questions. So I've mentioned my name and I'm an adjunct professor at the School of Labor and Urban Studies where I was able to, um, through a series of circumstances, actually found a project called Community and Worker Ownership Project here at the school. And by way of introducing myself, I'll say a few things. Um, I th is the chat enabled, Dave, um, Michael? I wanted people to put in the it, chat who they are. It is, yeah, people okay. can add to the chat anytime. Okay, so while I introduce myself, I'm going to invite people to introduce themselves, uh, a little bit of us knowing in the room. If you're affiliated with a union or many, you can name the unions. If you're affiliated with worker co-ops or any kind of co-ops, you can mention that. If you have an affiliation to the school, please tell us. Um, so let me take a minute and, and put the context of who I am. And uh, thank you. I see Elias Krim in the room who just recently uh, recorded an interview with me. So later, Elias, you could put that in the chat. People could read what I'm about to tell you. Um, I'm a union carpenter. In, the 19, in 1980, I became a carpenter uh, from the good graces of actually a worker co-op that was expanding their warehouse and required that whoever got the job to do the construction hired and included a woman or minority at the time, they said, to get training. And that's how I became a carpenter straight out of college. Um, joined the union soon after and um, had a good run of working on my tools and went to the apprenticeship program where I was able to become an educator with the training fund. Actually, also some government dollars that supported educators in the union movement to develop our skills and I became uh, certified in adult vocational education. I went on and had uh, 15 wonderful years at the consortium for worker education, thanks Joe McDermott, I see on the call. And there I was able to do a number of workforce development programs with different sectors, not least of which, but perhaps most of which included the baking industry, as well as pre-apprenticeship programs in New York City. Uh, during that time, I studied organizational change management. I described to people that's like a, a progressive MBA. I learned how business could work when it works well, along with my constant critique for worker power. It was a great way to, to get smarter and build my skills. And then I was lucky enough to be hired um, by Dean Mancius in a senior position at then the Murphy Institute. But soon after, I, I then went on to do other things, which was found the Community and Worker Ownership Project and start a worker co-op called New Deal Home improvement, which we then, uh, after three years, went out of business. That's a different story, but I have that experience to share. And then at SLU, continued with this project where I was able to um, put together a number of things around education, 
uh, not least of which, but perhaps most of which includes a graduate level certificate that we now have at the school for courses in called Workplace Democracy and Community Ownership. So I hope people are putting in the chat where they come from and we'll talk more about that and there'll be ways that people can exchange um, information in the chat. What I wanna do um, is tell you what happened next. We all know what happened two years ago with COVID hitting and in a, um, I came across this quote just about two years ago now um, when things were rapidly shifting. And I appreciated this quote, gave me a lot to think about. There are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And I think many of us saw those changes happen before us. And I think most of us might even say, it's hard to believe it's been uh, two years, but what a weird time it has been. So I got this strange call on the morning uh, in early June Someone congratulated me for something I didn't even know happened. What happened was I was appointed by the mayor to be on an advisory council um, for workforce, uh, for, for labor and workforce development. The mayor was uh, forming about um, 10 advisory councils to help with managing the crisis. And so for um, seven consecutive weeks, we were in meetings talking about um, all kinds of things that we all can recall with um, the crisis of the pandemic hitting hard. And this was really a management control issue, I think. But one thing that uh, de Blasio said in one of his visits to the meeting is, we're gonna need some radical ideas. We should be thinking about worker co-ops. Um, it really was a coincidence. I was on stack to talk that day and I was next after he spoke. And the coincidence was great. And I spoke about co-ops and there was some activity in the chat. And the next few weeks, I would it would come up occasionally. I proposed that we start a working group on unions and co-ops. I was told that at that point, no recommendations were being accepted. And I did something that some of you might find fun or cute, but someone said to me, you know, I was like, what do I do now? And someone said, well, what would a white man do? And so I did what I channeled some of you or some of them, and I just did it. And really thanks to CUNY, and my Zoom account, I started a monthly group. The monthly group met for 12, uh, 12 months. Uh, this is a breakdown of sort of who was in the room. There were usually an average of about 60 or 65 people in the room. I think since then we might've gotten a little tired of Zoom, but then we were hungry to really talk things over. So this was a wonderful way. And there's a record of a lot of the meetings in my blog and some will put the, the blog in the chat if you wanna see some of what those conversations were, but a lot went on. Um, I would bring guest speakers. I would um, really channel some of uh, my best mentors and say, um, what questions should I prepare people for before they even arrived? And we had wonderful conversations. As a result, the deputy mayor Thompson um, what, had taken interest and he assigned a, um, one of his interns, an urban fellow to work with me to write about it. And her name is Bernadette King Fitzsimmons and Bernadette worked with me and we pulled together a lot of what we knew to put together case studies and what I call the toolkit for cooperative solutions. And again, we'll put that in the chat if you haven't seen it. And for some of you, I think it's even why you're here. But I want to clarify this about co-ops because not everybody knows this. And um, there are some things I wanna clarify. I did ask in the chat, how many people are familiar with unions and how many people are familiar with co-ops. And um, the screen is small enough that I can see pretty much that I think I see a lot of unionists in the room. What I wanna clarify is that, um, Co-ops, there are different types of co-ops, worker co-ops, consumer co-ops, we know of as food co-ops, purchasing co-ops, we may know of Ace Hardware. Um, I don't know if people even know, Land of Lakes is an agricultural co-op, credit unions, housing co-ops. What's important to realize is that in each case, it's the, mem it's the class of membership. Who belongs? It's a very important question of who belongs. The multi-stakeholder co-op may have uh, consumers and workers as an example of something we can dry, strive for. But one can imagine, for example, in a consumer co-op, if the ownership and control of those who belong are the consumers, 
they may not have the same interests as the workers. They may want the lowest price. They may want particular products while the workers may have other interests. So pay attention to this always. And often in our union spaces, we like to talk about worker co-ops since workers are who we care about often, but we all are consumers as well. And we all use the stuff that we buy, make and produce. What I wanna make sure I also can clarify in this talk and in others is that what unions do. Unions um, really are able to represent something for the broader working class, the collective bargaining agreement, the established job titles, standards, terms and conditions for employment. We can thank all kinds of health and safety standards to a union movement. Um, across an industry or sector, they help establish the floor, make sure there are standards that we all can live by and force other people to rise to, other businesses to rise to those standards. I really do a special shout out to labor management joint funds that I spent a big part of my career working for, knowing that multiple employers can contribute to these funds. There may be pension, pension healthcare, training and upgrading, legal help and others things. But let me take a pause and put this in context of a much broader movement. And I, the next two slides give us context and then we'll go back into the, the details of today's talk. This is um, something from the Climate Justice Alliance. It's called the Framework for a Just Transition. And if people haven't seen it, I do wanna give you a moment to look at it. But what I also wanna say is Google this and become familiar with this and similar images. Basically, they talk about there's the extractive economy. We may wanna call it capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, imperialism, a lot of things where there's an enclosure of wealth and power. And then there's the regenerative economy or the living economy. And that might be where we wanna to move to. And part of the idea in the framework for a just transition is that some of us are breaking down the pieces of the extractive economy, while some of us are building up the pieces of the living economy. And I think this is very important to understand so that there's not exactly a right and a wrong place to do our work. There are multiple places to do our work for justice and you find your place and you do it, but sense, and you do it for that time and you can move. But in the middle of these circles where you see the word work, I want to identify the fact that um, that's where organized labor often is and that's where worker co-ops would be. So I want to give you that. And there's one other image I wanna give you that is from a different presentation I just was part of. And there's a new uh, grouping called uh, Solidarity Economy Principles. And if people are not familiar with SE or Solidarity Economy, it's another thing we should be paying attention to. If I could ask people to raise their hand, how many people are familiar with mutual aid? You can put your hand up if the hand is, if, if it's yes. Thanks. And mutual aid is really a, ancient in many ways. It's how we come to the aid of one another. In the solidarity economy, we're putting it in this place where the solidarity economy rests on shared values of cooperation, democracy, social and racial justice, environmental sustainability, and mutualism. And I wanted to offer this because it's more and more growing as there's so many different ways to talk about cooperative economics, a new economy, the next system. Solidarity economy is one of the terms that I appreciate as we uh, build out these, this concept. So as I went on to do work with the Community and Worker Ownership Project and designing training um, and learning from the School of Hard Knocks, I realized there's really four ways to think about a good business, a good operation. You need to have a sense of the world you're living in, what are the policy and dynamics for that? Let's call it the globe. And you need to have a sense of how to do it well, how to do it with compassion and heart. And that's really how we run a business when we give a damn about the people who are in it. And the hands are the finances and the craft. So too often in cooperative economics or in, in should I just say in economics uh, for the working class, people often have a great skill they want to do and bring to work. They say, I want to start that business. I can't tell you how many people um, I got to know who wanted to start a baking business because they love to bake. But if they didn't understand how to manage the finances of that business, they could fail. So that would be the, the left hand and the right hand, the finances and the skill. 
but also how do you run the business in a way that really takes care of the people? That would be the heart. And re really significantly, how do you understand how that business fits in the broader economy? And how do you have a voice there? We all know, um, unfortunately, some of the largest influencers are lobbyists for businesses. Well, our unions also have lobbyists, and isn't that good that we have some lobbyists for the working class? But that's where any good entity would have some way to pay attention to and influence the, uh, the political economy that they live within. How do we pay attention to the legislation? So to summarize this in, in this other way, I'd say that unions help with legislative heft, lobbyists, lawyers, et cetera. And can a single cooperative business do that? And I'll ask a question about the heart how we manage ourselves and each other's. Unions serve as a check and balance. That's a big part of that collective bargaining agreement is it sets some, some terms down in writing, rules that we all can live by. And one might say, can a single cooperative do that? One of the things I learned is that the collective bargaining agreement when applied to a cooperative is this wonderful tool. Now the rules are written, let's keep going, let's build the business but we can establish it with this high road principles of the CBA. And then I'll say the financial management. Can, the unions help, can help secure financing packages, access loans, bring some um, trusted financial advisors and understand that unions, when they wanna go and take on a fight with a company, they often look under the hood to the finances to say, well, can they really afford? That's a level of financial acumen that I've only gotten to know thanks to some of my union brothers and sisters. And then there's the craft. And as a carpenter trained hard in the union movement, I'll say it's a wonderful, wonderful place we can teach people the craft. But part of that wonderfulness is that it's not just for one company. There were years I worked as a carpenter where I had 12 W-2s, but I had one training fund. And I was able to move from company to company because I was shepherded through a common denominator being the union through all these companies. And so I would ask, can a single co-op do that? So I, what I wanna say is really unions for the working class help shape industry. They predict industry changes. They have eyes and ears inside the companies, which might include something like, it's time to sell this company. Maybe the workers wanna buy it. Who's gonna hear that? They can help raise the floor for the market and they can fight for workers across the supply chain. Think about that when we wanna think about the entire food system for which our central workers work, for example. And not one single business or one single co-op can do that. And then you have what co-ops do. Co-ops, are, ex when done well, are ex can exemplify good industry standards and good business practices. They also have eyes and ears inside the company and they can exemplify what is a, a good work experience. And they can model worker ownership and control inside a supply chain and throughout. So I wanna share this image, which I loved and have been playing with thanks to Co-op Cincy. Out of Cincinnati for the last 12 years has been growing an entity that is very, very deeply uh, tied with the union movement and looking at unions and co-ops. And they say, you know, when you have a, a business, look at the central circle where there's a board of directors, management and the union committee, that union committee can step outside of the company and into the bigger sphere. And that becomes an important liaison activity for a unionized co-op. So to repeat, union co-ops can help scale with their values. They can bring collective bargaining uh, forward with clear expectations. They're check and balance. I want to really say when the workers need a hand, they're not alone. And Shelly, I'll send you the deck. <laughs> but um, connects for a platform for acting in solidarity. And isn't that great when we can have that as a bigger voice than any one company, but the workers have a connection to their comrades, brothers, sisters, siblings in the next company and the next. So this is what it could look like if we have lots of high road businesses inside one movement where the, each business operates with some autonomy and has a connection and the union movement can help with that. 
So let me now turn to the toolkit, which is available for everybody's pleasurable reading, and it's in the chat, I think, already, where we've really went through case studies and tried to say much of, uh, in a different way, but what I've already been saying, that the unions, um, when a union gets involved with co-ops, how that can really strengthen worker power. So these are the different tools. We had some uh, a company called Partner and Partners, which was a recently converted design firm in New York City, about six different people who um, was a small firm doing um, graphic design that converted to a worker co-op and they did this work for us, putting the, uh, in terms of the visuals. And these are some of the different tools, but what I wanna say the most important tool I wanna shout out to is openness to innovative organizing. And I would really honor a few people on this call if you don't mind me shouting out your names, but I wanna thank Andy Stern for some of this work. I wanna thank Joe McDermott as people who really have shown an openness to innovative organizing as a way to say we can do more for the working class. And then the different tools that get put together when somebody cares to be open-minded is issues around the contract negotiations, professional expertise like lawyers and organizers, sectoral analysis that includes lawyers and people who can look at uh, the lobby issues with policy, access to capital, use of union space and the training funds. And I'm just gonna run through a few case studies and they're all in the, in the toolkit so you can enjoy them. I love this story having spent many summers in Maine. Uh, lobster men and women were forced by regulation to be independent, one-on-one. -on -one. You have your own business, that's the regulation. But they were able to come together with the machinists who invited a bunch of uh, lobster men down to their training center in Maryland for several weeks at a time to really strategize together. They put their lobbyists on this, the lawyers on this, and they ended up um, forming an affiliate local of lobster men and women who would now have um, an aggregate way to market and sell their catch. And by doing that, they were able to play in the market against what was otherwise some superpowers. This is a story that every New Yorker who cares about worker justice should know about, and I can talk about it for a long time, but I'll be very brief at this moment and say Cooperative Home Care Associates, 37 years old, started with 12 people out of a social service agency. It's now 2,000 workers. About three quarters of them are worker owners, mostly women of color, unionized 15 years into its existence because they knew they couldn't get the power they needed to fight for the the uh, reimbursement rate coming through Medicaid for their workforce and their business if they weren't tied to a bigger force. They got a collective bargaining agreement. Their um, union reps will say it's the best employer by far in their sector. They've never had to go to arbitration. Conflicts get handled cooperatively in the way that cooperative management can happen well. They've been regular guest speakers in my class called Cooperative Management for a Changing World, where they talk about how they handle conflict. So here, as you can see, a few different ways these tools may have been used for cooperative home care. And then just very briefly, I'll mention these in the interest of time, I can always go back. And again, you can read this. This is on the West Coast and SEIU United Healthcare Workers West paired with Futuro Health really put together something when the hospitals were changing who they were hiring and a lot of uh, unionized workers were being laid off and let go while the work for long-term care was being put out into the community, this became a way to organize differently the workforce. And so they formed a co-op that um, is the LVN cooperative that uses the allied up co-op for training and helps move people in through the, through the sector. So there's another way to put them to work. This is still very new, very novel and being experimented. People's Choice Communications is another New York City story. Unfortunately, we know that the spectrum workers remain on strike. It's the longest strike that I've heard of. And workers who were uh, receiving some funds through the strike fund decided to try and start their own company. And they have formed People's Choice Communication to do the um, internet service uh, installations. And that's operating today. New Era Windows is, a, is an exciting story out of Chicago. It's about 10 or 12 years old. 
the, it was a much larger window and door company and the workers who were unionist, unionized through UE noticed that a lot of uh, equipment was being shipped out of the factory. And soon they realized the factory was being put up for sale and they occupied it. It was actually two different subsequent occupations for them to take over the company. But this is really a worker takeover and buyback and they now own the company. Homeland Grocery, 100% employee owned and the United Food and Commercial Workers helped them pull that together by putting together a demand in the structure of the, um, of the employee ownership that it would be 100% employee owned, not options by which tier you were in, but every worker would have an option. And they have an excellent practice of how they teach people to understand the finances of their business. This is a, a story that's not in the toolkit that we wrote, but it came to my attention more recently. And it's out of um, uh, the Midwest, not my, I'm forgetting where, but um, what Snow River did, there was a, a larger company of a number of custom wood manufacturers and their biggest customer was Walmart. And Walmart um, stopped doing business with them and they were told they're gonna to close all the factories. It was a foreman on the floor at Snow River that said to union rep, when a union rep had come in to talk about the closure, where he said, no, 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 this company does not have to close. There is business for us. We know it, we can prove it. And so the union helped them convince the company to uh, separate it from the other, from the, the, uh, the other factories that were around the country and sold this one company to, and the union helped put together the package to make that deal. So again, you could see where the access to capital would come in. And then I just wanna talk very briefly and um, with this concept, Co-op Cincy and Co-op Dayton are two um, small cities. Sometimes I have small city envy, even though I love New York and say in these small cities, there was an attempt and successful to put together a number of unions along with a number of business needs and look together at what they can do. And they've built in each city about a half a dozen, I think since you may have even a dozen now companies, although small, they're setting the example of how you can do business within a supply chain together. In, in LA, there's been an attempt to do this to purchase a mall in Crenshaw. It was fraught. It's not necessarily a happy ending yet, but it's a process of saying, when we put the community together with labor, what can we do? And then I'll point to, in New York, we have the Bronx Co-op Development Initiative, and in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Communities Collaborative. And soon we may see another slide here about Astoria, where we can see where different players in a community come together and say, we have to look at the anchor institutions, we have to look at labor, we have to look at the industries that are in our community, look at the colleges, look at the healthcare institutions and say, how can we use anchor institutions to build the local economy? This becomes a big way to use co-ops and unions in partnership for a solidarity economy. So again, bringing these different tools together. So as a review, I'll say the union fights for good standards and can support the creation of co-ops as best in class. A cooperative is a single company, a high road company, but a single company. A union works with many companies to establish and maintain high standards. So they support each other. It's not either or. They exist and influence in different spheres, but can beautifully overlap. This is what solidarity looks like. So this is another vision of what solidarity looks like, where we can say we're all in this together. And I would want to add this one piece for those who develop co-ops. It's the whole business sphere of people who are speaking to businesses and startups about, about forming cooperative businesses, I would say, ask, is there a union in the company? Is there a union in the sector? They can be your friend. Let's do this together. Because what are the standards that are advocated for in the broader movement? They should be attended to in any single cooperative business too. And then really look to say, do you have labor neutrality language? in your operating documents so that you, right away, a, a cooperative business is formed with labor neutrality, with that vision and hope for deeper solidarity. So I would ask the question, what could solidarity look like? 
And I think now what we'll do rather than use the chat is open up for Q&A, see what conversations people want to bring up. I'll end with this one quote in the deck after we read this. Arthur Chiliotis, many of you know, as uh, the president of local 1180 CWA, now retired, was a regular attendee of the working group that I mentioned. And he says, it doesn't matter what work you do, you're entitled to live a decent life. And that is the cooperative movement. That is the labor movement. That is social justice movement. And we are in our separate lanes, but I think we all need to understand that the goal is the same for all of us. And to the extent we can work together, we should. And I wanted to thank him for that quote. And I will stop sharing screen and open up for us to talk together. Um, what people wonder, what they grapple with in this whole space of unions and co-ops and the solidarity economy. So let me open it up. I see I have um, two screens of people. Sophia, I see your hand is up and people can raise their hand physically if they're on screen or use the raised hand feature. Well, first of all, thank you, Rebecca. This was super interesting and thank you for all your work. I'm here with my Herb 612 class uh, and we've enjoyed this uh, presentation. And um, I hope it's okay to ask you to talk because maybe it's a little bit off topic, but I'm always very curious about like the decision-making processes within worker co-ops and how that might relate to, you know, the connecting co-ops to unions. So if could, you could tell us a little bit more and maybe with examples of what it looks like for workers to be making decisions about their business or about, you know, whatever the cooperative is. Yeah, you know, when I was putting together this deck, there were so many directions I could go in. And I was like, how do I keep it within the right time frame? So, you know, I teach this class and I'll mention it again because it's my, I, I think I grew my whole life to this moment to teach it <clears throat> called um, Cooperative Management for a Changing World. So the question really is, you know, in a real lived way, what does democracy look and feel like? How do people show up? And I think that the intersectionality of all the world's problems, the fact that we live each of us in different ways with the trauma put upon us because of it, and you can name your ism and the, and the oppression, that people, it's hard to show up fully, proudly with joy, even if you might love your work. And so how do we welcome each other in a way that really feels, I'd say democratic, but also inclusive, engaging? Um, in co-ops, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made together, but not every decision has to be made together. So what happens is very, very clear structures. It's not always hierarchical, but sometimes it is. There's somebody who's in charge of certain areas of work and they're responsible to tell other people how that has to happen or when. But certain decisions that have to do with the state of the company, um, the size of jobs we may take, new hires, firing, need to be made in a collective way. So a lot of what we know about um, consensus making uh, decisions works very nice. There's something called sociocracy. My class was studying last night. How do you make decisions in small groups and feed into the next group and the next group? So there's um, science that says people, you know, the joy people get in small groups, don't disrupt that. And a small group is usually anywhere from like four to 10 or 12. And so trying to say we, we're, we're people work in teams, um, Something else that we talk about a lot is self-directed work teams. So when people, there's no one necessarily telling you how to do it, how do you think as a group it can best get done? When you have the transparency of what it takes and what's needed, and you have the democracy of everybody having a voice, you might end up with some really good solutions. I often say the guide rails to good democratic and cooperative decision-making is transparency and democracy. But democracy can't be at such an extent where, go ahead, go vote when you get a chance. You need to know who you're voting for, what you're voting for. You need to understand, you need to have a voice. And sometimes it's a say that's more than a vote at, you know, on a lever. So understanding how people can engage in decision-making also means making sure they understand what goes into all that information and bringing that forward. Um, I'd say that to some extent it compares well with some good hard union organizing 
where unions also have people decide. And I saw Brandy was on this call. Brandy, I don't know if you want to speak up, but I want to shout out Brandy L. Duke, who um, just someone I just met, who is a union organizer for Starbucks in Astoria. And Brandy was rave. I know you just put something in your mouth. I'm so sorry, but she was raving to me about how exciting it was for people to make decisions about what demands they were going to put to the management at Starbucks. Yes, Joe, in Astoria. And so Brandy is, if you want to say something about decision making that happens in union organizing, and then we could think about how that compares to what happens in a cooperative. Um, I can say something a little bit. We're still a little early in our unionization process as we're about to like have a vote for election, but we have already started discussing different like as teams in like small groups and then like coming together, we have a big plan to come together and try to talk about it. But um, we've already even started fantasizing about like the different things we can ask for at the bargaining table. And it's been so nice to be able to hear one, like a lot of people have a, some very different ideas that like you don't even consider yourself. Um, and we've also seen some like influence from the Buffalo members of Starbucks unionization. They asked for like a tip rate where Starbucks, where we're supposed to require like, if we don't get a 550 tip rate, Starbucks will supplement it. And that's something like I personally never would have thought about. But then like I was talking to one of my partners about wanting to do like a profit sharing for our location, which Starbucks probably wouldn't like, but I think would be really cool and dope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Brandy, I wanted to bring that forward, Sophia, to sort of do a compare and contrast, of, or maybe it's not a contrast, when people are allowed to work together, some beautiful decision making can happen. So it's that, again, that openness to innovation. I see T.A. Tran is on, and I don't, uh, go ahead, T.A. Hi, um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Great. Um, I know that you had said that unions are, have an advantage in terms of doing a lot of like the uh, horizontal coordination work across different workplaces and different sectors, whereas cooperatives are more concentrated in the one workplace. I was wondering if there are um, examples or like a precedent for cooperatives doing that solidarity work with other um, workplaces and other cooperatives and other sectors. Um, and if not, well, why not? And why is it that unions are uh, much more, like they have a history of doing that a lot more than cooperatives? Yeah, I can answer that to some extent. And I don't have to always be the one answering. So um, I can see if other people want to add to this. But um, I just was um, speaking with someone about um, Arismendi Bakery in the Bay Area that started with one bakery and then they started another bakery and another bakery and then a few other uh, bakeries and food related businesses joined the network and they call themselves a secondary co-op. And as someone was explaining to me the role of a secondary co-op, I thought it really plays a, a role much like a union in a sector. So you really look at how do we organize in sectors? And I think we have to recognize that capitalism has really created something that looks like Everybody does their own thing. A lot of individualism in terms of how we solve problems and unions break that down and co-ops break that down. But the individual businesses that grow are still following that suit of like, I got mine, I got mine. So we have to think differently about the uh, cooperativism of organizing businesses by sector. The other thing that happens is industry associations is another thing that pulls people together. And then we have to ask, for whose interest. So that's where unions help so much guarantee sort of for the workforce, for worker interest. I don't know if that begins to answer that, Tia, you can follow up if you want. Anybody else? Some more questions in the room? I don't want to put anybody on the, on the spot, but, um, oh, Joe Montero. You're muted. You're muted, Joe. Hi, I'm from the other side of the world, literally. Ah. Uh, in Australia, in Melbourne specifically, we do have uh, the beginnings of a cooperative or, or development, a further development of a cooperative movement, uh, including uh, worker co-ops and just starting it. And a lot of the stuff 
you've represented, Rebecca, is very familiar. But I, I'd just uh, I'd like to mention a couple of problems that are emerging that need to be dealt with. And just wonder whether you, you're getting them there. What's the response? Uh, in our history, earlier in our history, particularly in the early beginnings of the 20th century, there was a big cult movement in this country, in Australia. Uh, it fell victim to its success over time. It be, they, you know, the, some of the co-ops became very big, particularly the pharma co-ops, and the corporate world came in and offered uh, an open checkbook and basically took it over for money. So that's something to watch out for. Uh, but more immediately, uh, there's the problem as we're starting to grow. Sometimes people come in uh, and they tend to have more of a, a corporate or administrative hat. And we found or we're finding more and more as we go along that we need to do, we need to focus on training of people who come into, into our co-ops. And so we've just set up a, a training co-op as well to help with that as well as uh, train people in some of the technical stuff. I'm also, as I said before, I'm, I've been involved for 30 years in the housing cooperative movement and the same problems happen there. You know, and, and, and this sort of loss of focus of what the principles, you know, the social principles can lead to divisions and friction within co-ops. And, and we're really still grappling how to find ways to change this uh, but also uh, two other points two positive things uh, uh, which because we're working closely with the trade union movement uh, there and not only in terms of uh, of getting this into bargaining agreements but also the unions setting up conditions one example is uh, we have a factory that produces hot water systems uh, low energy use last a long time, stainless steel. And to get as part of the agreement that they get when they need hot water systems, that's union members, that they get these uh, at a good price. Uh, and, you know, and understanding the money goes back in, it's a not-for-profit uh, sort of enterprise. Another one is we've already set up is an energy. Uh, we have uh, energy retail companies here separated from generation. And we've set up a, a, an energy retail cooperative so we can buy power for households, for businesses, uh, for anyone who signs up as part of that cooperative. Uh, and the unions are, are very much involved in that. We're also looking at the possibility of home building, starting off smaller scale uh, as a project uh, about to get underway. And the purpose of this is not only to get support from union members that this is a good idea and from other people as well, but there are tangible benefits from it. That, that yeah. improve the standard of living uh, and, and you know, getting that message across. So I just nice. wonder whether any of that stuff's all so familiar. It's, it all sounds familiar. All of it sounds familiar. Um, we have students right now in our classes who are exploring some of these uh, concepts and also movements in our city. We have a pretty strong co-op movement in New York. But I want I want to I want to summarize my response to you with uh, something you asked at the very beginning. You talked about an emerging problem. Um, what I hear repeatedly is the challenge of member engagement. So I do think that the way late stage capitalism has brought us the way we have arrived now through late stage capitalism is a lot of people are hands off on solving their problems. They're, they've given up. There's a lot of like helplessness, that uh, learned helplessness. And even um, that's not my job. I'm not gonna touch that. And then they go on with whatever. And so what happens is that notion of membership in co-ops and in unions is a very, very important thing for us to look at because it's also about belonging. And when we wanna think about belonging, which late stage capitalism has taken from us, if you're lucky you belong to a family, not much more beyond that, you know, a nuclear family for all that, how do we actually really enliven the sense of belonging and make sure that people are engaged? And the, the response goes further to um, what Sophia asked at the very beginning about democratic engagement is how do we engage people? What I'll say is that 
this is an emerging problem because we're finally listening to the fact that people don't feel engaged and that the solution to me is education, education, education. But that's because that's the language I speak is I always want to go in with education. So now the new worker education might include more democratic skills. How do we listen? How do we pay attention? The sociocracy model or something else like that, where we use little hubs to bring people together in small groups and bring them all into a larger group are all ways that we cultivate belonging and member engagement. So I, you, know, you raise a lot of issues, but I want to summarize it with education and training. And I see Norma JF is next. Hi, hi everybody. Um, my note in the chat tells you what you already know, that this is tremendously important to do, just to bring people together who are doing this as a, a, a difference from doing everything separately, which we're accustomed to in, this, in the capitalist system, the eight hour a day system. Uh, one of the things we have to remind people, and I say we have to say these things out loud with people, we are opposed to the eight-hour day. We don't mind if you work 24 hours a day because that's what you love and want and can, um, but we will not command an eight-hour day. That's the beginning of it. We will offer the opportunity to define your work relationship. And that's the big thing. Uh, how do we produce what we like together, what we like and need? That's a huge step away from capitalism, from the colonialism that we've inherited. We are all colonized, as we all know. Uh, and how do, we, how do we move away? And I'm saying that we stay that together that although you might be going into a place that manufactures window screen after window screen after window screen for the end of your time, or you want to be talking about what we'd like to be able to be doing together and how that socialist communist system works to serve our guts, our souls. And that that's what the whole thing is about. The whole thing is not about improving our slavery, our enslavement, to the profit system, um, that having to do that work, that command work in order to maintain that co-op project is what crushes co-ops. So if people have the idea together that we're working for the whole picture of uh, a pleasant life where we get our hands, whether that's our minds, our bodies, whatever, on doing things that the community needs, the community and we ourselves need to have us doing. Uh, well, anyway, this effort, I think, shush. <laughs> this, Thank you, Norma. That, wait a second. Okay, I'm not sure if there was a question there, but go on, it's all good. Um, oh, I hope that this is this opens up comment from all these people. The only reason I'm speaking now is because nobody else was going to, and so I wanted to keep it going. I started my comment with that. It, this is the most important thing about doing this work is bringing these efforts together. And then I thought about it and I said, I take it back, doing this work being the most important. It's not, it's just part of, all these things that are going on are so important and, and really brilliant. Uh, and the effort, right, I finished saying what I need to say. Um, no, thank you. I often say um, food, care, and repair. That's the economy of the future, the past, the present, the every time. We're going to need to make sure we have systems for food, care, and repair. And how do we do that in a way that's somewhat democratic and engaging? Laura, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, just to, to reiterate a bit of what I was saying in the chat, um, you know, so often we talk about this idea of a radical imagination and, you know, dreaming of the world that we want to live in, dreaming of the world that we want, you know, the future to be. Um, and 
it's exciting and it's inspiring, but it's also can be upsetting because you look around and you realize the world that you're actually in. Um, but just, just to say, what, what are some of your experiences with unions? How have, how have you been working with unions? What are their reactions to worker cooperatives? Uh, yeah. Well, thanks, Laura. And I also see Shelly's hand up, so I'm going to make sure she gets a time, a moment. 1199 and UFCW are two unions in New York City that have come around this space quite a bit. And I want to, you know, it's that open, uh, of course, the toolkit, um, the whole notion of the toolbox was not accidental. It was like, it's a language I speak, but the first thing you need is that open toolbox. You have to be willing with an open mind to step in and say, we're willing to try something different. Um, I don't think Andy Stern's still on the call. I think he might, if he is, he may want to speak a little bit about SEIU's openness over the years. Um, but I think trying to figure, trying to be willing, the machinists also, I'll give them that shout out, although mostly it's it's the international and what they did with the lobster men. Um, um, the, steam, uh, the steel workers have done a lot in the Midwest. It's more like showing up and saying, we're going to put some of our tools that we've mentioned in the toolkit for example, behind some innovation. And so I'm hoping that the UFCW and 1199 in New York will do more along with, I can go down a long list of others I wish and hope for, uh, the building trades, not least of which um, we can work on that, Laura. Because you see, it also has to do with the companies. So it's one part of the equation is the union and the other is the companies. And if we can purchase some, com if we can help workers purchase some companies that are unionized, we may have another way in, not unlike what we saw with New Era Windows. But Shelley, who uh, does a lot to help co-op uh, businesses convert to co-ops, may want to speak. She works with the ICA group. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. So my first part is a comment, and then the second is more question. I hope you can answer. And on the first part, listening to the conversation, one of the things that attracts me to this whole movement for a, a, quite a while, I've always had an interest in what I call creating a new economic system. So I actually don't like when we refer back to systems that have already been, whether we say capitalism, communism, socialism. I'm like, okay, well, they thought of that. They thought of those. We can take the best of whatever parts and leave the bad. But let's do a whole new system. Like that's what I'm excited about in hearing this and hearing about like integrating like the unions and to worker co-ops and shared services and all of these um, things. And yeah, it's complicated, but I'm like, let's uh, move forward in our thinking. Like, so I'm right now I call it the cooperative economy, you know, and hope that's a system. But my question goes to something I had gone to and I had heard Union, we're talking about the, the uh, individual companies and some of them saying, oh, they didn't want to go with what they call like the corporate unions. So they wanted to start their own unions. And I was trying to understand that. So if you could speak to that. Well, that's a big question. Um, there, are, there is some new organizing that's pretty exciting where people are starting their own unions. White Electric Coffee in Rhode Island is a story where workers got together just a few months into the pandemic when the, the their coffee shop was going to reopen and they gathered in a circle in the local park on a regular to talk. And I, I often channel the idea of in a circle, right? Because that's a style of thinking of collective management. And they said, what do we want? And they ended up with a list of demands for the new company, for the company that they worked for, gonna reopen. We want health and safety. By the way, there's no ramp. We want there to be accessibility. We don't have good practices hiring people of color. It was soon after George Floyd's murder and everybody's becoming a little bit more woke and they're looking at, okay, what kind of diversity and inclusion can we have? And while we're at it, we want a union and maybe we want to own the company. So it was a big fight, but they self-organized a union. They had the vote that still had to be managed by the National Labor Relations Board. They won the vote for their own union. And that night, everybody got an email from the owner saying they're putting it on the market. They have the first right of refusal to buy the company. And that's an interesting story because it is one of self-organizing a union 
and a purchasing of the co-op. They ended up working with a, uh, the uh, cooperative fund of the Northeast and were able to put together the financing and they did some crowdsourcing and they put, they put it together. But that's really in, in many ways an exception. We have a very strong and robust union movement that does bring these other tools. That self-organized union was not able to bring the tools that I illustrate in the toolkit because it's just the same 12 people who were baristas and were, right? But when you're attached to this bigger movement, you're attached in, in many cases to these national and international movements of workers where you can have more influence legislatively, regulatorily, and, um, and for, for good and for bad, right? Bigger isn't always better, but it is about having power where power matters. Um, I saw Joe, I, Joe McDermott, you had your, fin your hand up. Do you wanna say something or you were just clapping? See you later. I wanna ask more about that secondary co-op. I'm, really, I'm trying to figure out how it works. You got five bakers, all separate owners, or five accounting firms, separate owners. They're all co-ops. Do they share expenses, share profits? Their purpose they is political or their purpose is the democracy of, of, of worker co-ops or what? Usually it's to share the marketing, to share the promotion, to share a back office feature. Some of the things that not every company needs one, maybe the bookkeeper. Share, maybe, share resources. Share resources. Yeah. And, and is there financial would, in any way? Usually there's, there's a contribution. A pot, like, like the Jamaicans do a pot, central pot to keep them going. Right. It could be that where you there's a contribution to a central pot. But that, that seems like you and I, but that seems like a natural to get going early. And, with uh, Seth in Australia. Yeah. You've got all of these startups, they can't make it on their own, put them together in a secondary co-op relationship, or without using the word co-op at first. We're gonna talk about that. Yep. And, and, and can you introduce me someday to the woman from Starbucks Astoria? And maybe you and I can give her some resources for, for consulting and that kind of thing. Brandy, hey Joe, I'll make sure you talk more later. Thank I'm you. all in on that, Joe. Don't worry. I, that's on my list of things to do. Um, so well, yeah, Joe, tell, Joe's tell sort friends. of my, my, my uncle. I just tell I your friends one thing? That yeah. Rebecca is um, helping the consortium in the town of Astoria, you know, the seacoast town of Astoria, uh, to develop as many co-ops as possible. It's a question of capitalization, but there's a number of relationships you're talking about putting bartenders into an association and bookkeepers into an association until they then move to co-ops. And I'd be making much later to get to the unions, except to get union resources. And and by the way, you should add the machines locally to the list, not just the lobster machine, because Jimmy, Jimmy and IDG and all of that kind of thing. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. We'll get together. Um, so it's it's a minute before seven. I wanted to make sure that uh, open it up to anyone who may have had something they had to add to the room. Um, and see if Laura or Michael and or Nadia want to say something for the school. What I will say is we're now studying this as a certificate program in the urban studies department, which is exciting at the graduate level. Um, and, the and the classes are extremely dynamic and um, very uh, practical based. Who's doing what? You know, we are uh, learning as we go. And the network is amazing. I think uh, I see Matthew, who's from uh, maybe is it Georgia, Matthew, far away. And um, I don't know where Elias is from, but I know it, we, we've only met electronically. Um, and I see some New Yorkers, you know, Angel Garcia and I go way back. So I, there are so many different ways we are showing up in, in these spaces. It's exciting that the School of Labor and Urban Studies is hosting some of this. Angel, did you want to say something before we close off? Hi, yeah, uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, great, um, and everybody, great talk and great ideas. My, my only thought was just that, you know, it's one of those, uh, I remember uh, helping out a little bit with one worker co-op and uh, they, they so it's all these clashes that would take place and it was sort of reflective of this competitive you know, environment and um, the unfortunate added uh, factor that I would call the bochinche factor. Uh, um, for people who may not know, it's just sort of Spanish or Puerto Rican Spanish word for gossip. And and you had, you know, women who ordinarily would be collaborating together, um, just not, you know, the, the, the level of trust or mistrust 
just so strong. And I'm just thinking about, you know, uh, I, I don't know what, you know, what kinds of engagement between um, worker cooperatives and quote, the community, whatever, whatever we want to define as the community, a neighborhood or some part of the city, you know, whatever, whatever could be done to sort of get the cooperative way to be shown in a community center or community setting or, you know, in a, in a church or in a synagogue or um, yeah. something that might uh, sort of say, um, hey, let Astoria, let me use an example of Astoria, let Astoria be cooperative for a day and um, carry out specific activities uh, that might sort of uh, would be fun, right? Because you, you want to ultimately convey that this is fun because this is really the way that you have a heart, as you call it. And if there were ways to conduct events that would be out in a community and engage people who might not otherwise, like they're looking at this thing like, what does this smell like or look like or taste right. like? But if it would be fun and, and you can sort of convey some of the principles of cooperativism, for example, okay. um, yep. something that would start to break down, even if temporarily, some of the, the barriers that we have in this fiercely competitive country that we that Yeah. We I don't, whatever. Angel, thanks. Thank you so much. And, and I do want you to meet Shelly. I want you both to know each other so I can make an introduction if you want. Um, because you're both in, in business development with yes, high towards very justice. Much. Please make that connection. Okay, yeah. I will. And and um what I'll say, Angel, is you hit on something really important. Again, I referred to late stage capitalism, but whatever we want to call these days, you know, highly competitive, not kind, all this negative energy. And then there's something else that's happening right on top of it, perhaps because of it. And I'll call it mutual aid or solidarity or love belonging, sacred community, right? Um, beloved community, I think MLK calls it, that too. And so what we wanna do in, in the way of saying that there's no wrong door, how do we breathe in wherever we go, the notion of belonging, collaboration, even things like conflict resolution and helping when there's a little bit of conflict to unwrap it, because that comes, a lot of those conflicts come from the hurt and tra traumatized hearts that people are walking around with, right? I've said, I wanna stamp out betterism. I'm against racism and sexism, but I'm also against betterism. Like who's to say what's better than? And we want to enliven the fact that people belong. So this is really a, an organizing strategy, no matter where we land our church, our communities. And I think you're right to really say something like, let's celebrate it in my cooperativism for a day, every day. It's great. Thank you for bringing that up. So it's after seven, it was a one hour commitment. I wanna be uh, respectful of everyone's time. Um, I'll make sure my, my email's in the chat and we can keep talking um, offline in other ways, be in touch. Anything, any last word, Laura, you wanna add for the, um, for our, the fact that this was an alumni event. Yeah, sure. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much for this. This was really a wonderful space. Uh, the Alumni Association at the School of Labor and Urban Studies is looking forward to more events as we collaborate with the Public Programs Department. Um, once again, this was just a, a wonderful evening. Thank you everyone for coming. We'll be sure to be in touch and take care of yourselves until then. Thank you. And thank you, Michael and Nadia for uh, putting so much of the backbone here. Very appreciative. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.